of strange because out of about 20 flute players in our studio, you're the only guy. And so many think that the flute industry is so female dominated. So that's kind of where it started. And when I got to go to grad school and when I was in my research class, I had the opportunity to do a research paper on a person. And I chose the wonderful Dorio Anthony Dwyer because I wanted to learn more about her and my roots because a lot of us can tie back to her. And I realized it was so much more than a biography about her. She can be used as this pivotal lens to view the progression of sexism in the orchestra. And she has so many interesting stories out of so many females. She, we have so much on her. And I'm really, really passionate about this topic and I'm excited to share it with you today. I encourage you as you think of questions to put them in the chat. There's gonna be a few times where I wanna engage with you. Please don't hesitate to unmute your mic and briefly share with us or type it in the chat. And also there's gonna be a lot of things that make you feel. You might feel sad, you might feel mad. Go ahead and type that. Let's go ahead and feel together. I want this to be a conversation. And with that, I hope you all have a beverage. I have my water here. Cheers, let's go for it. So as I mentioned, I really honed in on Dorio Anthony Dwyer. So she's our pivotal lens. We'll look at sexism before her time as early as 1528, and we'll lead into the 1900s, look at her career and her legendary audition process. And then we'll look at stuff afterwards, where we are today, some firsthand accounts, and then hopefully we can figure out together how we can combat this nationwide problem. And I wanna begin with this idea of indecent instruments. According to Professor Melling, who's an associate professor at the University of Stavange, most females played the piano back in the day because it was considered to be in agreement with their mild and prudent temperament. Think of your shows like Bridgerton, books like Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. What are they playing in those? The piano or singing, we don't really see them doing much else. Well, why is that? I wanna look at this document from 1528 by, by Baldessare Castiglione. We're gonna look at this underlined red portion. Imagine how unlovely it would be to see a woman play drums, fifes, or trumpets, or other like instruments, and this because their harshness hides and destroys that mild gentleness which so much adorns every act a woman does. Here we have a very early account. We have fifes here. Of course, that is a relative to the flute. So here's an early account of women being discouraged from playing wind instruments. And let's look at a document from 200 years after in 1722 by music theorist, John Essex. This one is entitled, The Young Lady's Conduct or Rules for Education Under Several Heads with Instructions Upon Dress, Both Before and After Marriage and Advice to Young Wives. We're gonna look after the red line. It reads, the harpsichord, spinet, lute, and bass violin are instruments most agreeable to the ladies. There are some others that are really unbecoming to the fair sex, as the flute, violin, and oboe, the last of which is too manlike and would look indecent in a woman's mouth, and the flute is very improper, as taking away too much of the juices, which are otherwise more necessarily employed to promote the appetite and assist digestion. So again, another account, women were not encouraged to play flutes like we see today. You know, we see a lot of young women going into band rooms and they're getting pushed towards flute and boys almost get shunned away. And I'm going to use females and males, even though of course we know that the spectrum is so much larger just for the sake of this, understand that we're doing people that identify, all right? And interestingly enough, Professor Melling says that the recorder was considered highly erotic because of all these paintings of nymphs luring men in. So here we have all of these different things so far that are pushing women away. Carl Ludwig Junker is attributed to writing an article around 1783, 1784 about what instruments women should and should not play. He writes women should not play instruments like the horn, the cello, the contrabass, the bassoon, the trumpet, as those are for men only. But his reasonings are very interesting. 
He says that the bodily movements go against women's fashion. He mentions the idea of just how ridiculous it would be for a woman to wear a crinoline and stand at the double bass. Just ridiculous. And he said, imagine a woman with a fancy updo playing the trumpet. Just crazy to him. And of course, he, you know, the drums and trumpets were for the military, so men only, and horns were for hunting, so men only. And he also says about this idea that these instruments are very strong and powerful sounding, which goes against that, again, that idea of the mild and prudent temperament of a female. We're going to see this come along even as early as the 1938s. We're going to see these parallels. And don't even get him started on the position for playing cello. That just causes immoral thoughts. And women should not distort their face in any way to play an instrument because that means that they are indecent. So essentially, that's why women played the piano. In short, they could sit there with their legs closed and look pretty. But they should never perform it in public. They were really only encouraged to do it in their homes. And there's this interesting theory that was coined by Austrian music theorist Edward Hanslick entitled The Piano Epidemic or The Piano Plague. And in this theory, women with too strong of a sex drive could develop a hysteria linked to music. And some doctors went as far as to say that it could ruin their good looks and reproductive organs. So women should do everything and nothing all at once with music, right? Play it, but don't play it too well, and don't play it out of the home. So take notes of those several key points and see if you notice any parallels as we look at articles from 1938, we're going to begin. So this is an edition of Downbeat magazine from the February edition of 1938. And while it is primary, primarily a jazz magazine, there's an overarching emphasis on wind instruments in general. And I, we're gonna take quite a bit of time to read these together because I think they are so important and it'll make for great context as to what Doriel was going through during her time. This one is by Anonymous entitled, Why Women Musicians Are Inferior. Why is it that outside of a few sepia females, the woman musician was never born capable of sending anyone farther than the nearest exit? It would seem that even though women are the weaker sex, they would still be able to bring more out of a poor defenseless horn than something that sounds like a cry for help. You can forgive them for lacking guts in their playing, but even women should be able to play with feeling and expression, and they never do. Have you ever heard a woman saxophonist who didn't get a quavering tone with absolutely uncontrolled vibrato or a woman brass player who, even though she might have some power, still got a brassy, hard, unfinished quality of tone? Masculine strength is not necessary for brass, diminutive Roy Eldridge, who towers little more than five feet on a bicycle, has the greatest playing range of any trumpet player and looks as if a strong zypher would blow him right back to New Orleans. Yet women don't seem to be able to develop a lip, which stimmies they're taking more than one chorus at a time. The mind may be willing, but the flesh is weak. There are several psychological reasons underlying the apparent futility of women in dance orchestras, especially applicable to wind instruments. In the first place, women are as a whole emotionally unstable, which prevents their being consistent performers on musical instruments. Another point, though, it may seem laughable, is the fact that gals are conscious of the facial contortion so necessary in blowing it out and limit their power for fear of appearing silly in the eyes of men. Milady's dimples take an awful beating when reaching for the high notes, and dearie, was my face red on that last high note? I'm going to take a brief pause here. In these two paragraphs, emotionally unstable. That's an argument that we've been hearing time and time again. And I would love to know what, who was saying this? What female, who did they ask? This sounds like a male argument in my perspective. And down here, they're too self-conscious. Maybe some were, but do you think it was more because of their own feelings or what was society was projecting on them that they should feel that way? We're going to continue on right here where it says one reason. One reason, which is quite important, is the fact that until recently, 
Tradition has been against women's playing in dance orchestras. Co-education too is comparatively a new idea. And though many may deny it, heredity is too, is a prime factor in the development of any artistry and where men have had centuries of musical education behind them, women have only within the last few years come into their own as musical entertainers. Now that's interesting that they talk about co-education being a new idea. I think this is 1938. That's really not too long ago. And to put it even more into perspective, women weren't really allowed to have bank accounts until the 1960s. Just some further context here, what we're talking about and dealing with. Picking up here, if women as a whole were compelled to support themselves, there would doubtless be more capable musicians in the female ranks, but where careers are unnecessary except for personal gratification, there is little incentive to work for perfection. There was never a musician who didn't have to spend untold hours woodshedding his parts, and women don't seem to have the time, ambition, or the patience to do this. It may be that they are lazy, or it may be that with few exceptions, all of the girl bands in the country are vaudeville bands, where the standard of playing is considerably less than it is in dance bands. In these show bands, the prime requisite is good looks, after which comes playing ability and the art of being able to hold three or four other instruments. Witness a certain well-known girls band, which features 10 or 12 accordionists. About half the girls actually don't play the instruments, but further insult the average musician's intelligence by holding dummy accordions. The other half is made up of two or three who can actually play, and a few more who perform the game of push the button down on plainly marked bass chords. Then the average girl band generally has only a small library, which stagnates their natural ability, if any, and precludes any possibility of versatility. I wonder whose fault that could be. I wonder why they don't have a large library. And lastly, women are better performers on strings and piano, which are essentially sympathetic instruments more in keeping with their temperament. They do not shine on wind instruments, however, nor do they make good percussionists. If more girl drummers had cradle rocking experience before their musical endeavors, they might come closer to getting on the beat. Now, a reminder, this was actually published in a real magazine. This is real. And here again is that idea of temperament, piano and string being with that mild temperament, temperament of what they think a female should be, what that stereotype norm is supposed to be. And now we're going to take time to look at two rebuttals to this argument that were published, both by females in jazz, both legendary, one takes on the approach of almost affirming these gender stereotypes at the time and using them to her advantage, and the other one completely like batters it, shuts it down 100%. And then we're going to see some of those arguments in play as we go further. I'm going to take a moment to take a sip. All right. This first one is by Rito Vrito who is a leader of a very successful all-white girl band. And her rebuttal is entitled, Women Musicians Not Inferior, says Rito Rito. May I submit a rebuttal to my opponent as to why women musicians are not inferior? I should first like permission from the reader to dwell upon points pertaining to the performance expected from a dance orchestra. The first very essential requirement necessary to obtain desired results is endurance. The members of my orchestra have ridden all day and night in a bus and played a five-hour dance job, repeated the same the next day, and have received compliments from the promoter on their fine performance. They have also rehearsed several hours together while playing five hours at night for many days in succession and having complained. How many times one of our fellow musicians has remarked, even men won't do that. A second and important point is the feeling, tone, and phrasing which good musicians much obtain. This is a quality which girls alone are more likely to possess because of the aesthetic nature of their sex. I think our mutual public will agree that a warm, vibrant tone is much more pleasing than the masculine sock so often emphasized by our men bands. Rhythm in our modern swing generation is also of most important consideration, and I notice girls, because of their feminine tendency, 
cooperate to make a rhythm section a united unit dependent on each other rather than the masculine tendency to lead on his own instrument. So there are those ideas again of the feminine tendencies, right? You know, the cooperating, the aesthetic of it. We have those, the almost affirming those stereotypes that were much in place at the time, but using them to her advantage. Now let's look at the rebuttal by legendary Peggy Gilbert, who was a band leader and saxophonist. Um, one of my friends in undergrad had asked me if I could name a single female jazz saxophonist from before 2000, and I didn't have an answer. And she led me to Peggy Gilbert, who's one of the very few that's acknowledged. Hers is entitled, How Can You Blow a Horn with a Brazier? Now I'll warn you that this one is a little lengthy and it might make you mad, but that's okay. Go ahead and be mad, be sad, get angry with her. Dear Father Superior, you get up, make a lot of unintelligible noise and expect the people to shout bravo or echo in reverential tones a deep amen. You are like a small boy pulling his sister's pigtails when you think she hasn't a chance to fight back. You are the little boy who yells sissy from the window on the second floor. If Gene Krupa were a woman, how long do you suppose he would be an ace drummer in Benny Goodman's band? In evening gown, he might still be sensational, even hampered by brassiere straps, girdle, skirt, and high heels. But Mrs. GK or Miss Anybody couldn't make a one night stand with bags under her eyes. She could be good, but no matter how good, the public, especially the men, would not tolerate an unattractive secondhand stage prop. And that's one of the superficial reasons women are inferior to men as musicians, if they are. Their inability to make a career of music because for women, as a profession, it can last at best only a few years. Ha, we admit it, you say. You're absolutely right, but your line is as old as time. You think you have put women on the pan. You have, but it's been done for ages, Father Superior, ever since Eve, and far better than you could ever do it. Your weak, illogical, ineffectual argument is hardly resented. It's your attitude we resent because it expresses the attitude of all professional men musicians towards all professional women musicians. A woman has to be a thousand times more talented, has to have a thousand times more initiative to even be recognized as the peer of the least successful man. Why? Because of that age old prejudice against women, that time worn idea that women are the weaker sex, that women are innately inferior to men. So you actually think that because men have had centuries of musical education behind them, that the present masculine generation has inherited that knowledge, that talent, that's not worthy of you, father. We expect better arguments than that. Knowledge is not hereditary, and whether or not talent is present in the chromosomes is still a matter of conjecture. But even if it were, wouldn't a daughter, being a child also of a talented musician, be just as likely to inherit that characteristic as a son? If we were ladies, of course, we should ignore that thrust and tactfully help you to forget that you rambled a bit out of your sphere. Now, if you had said environment, perhaps we should have agreed. It's a man's world, admittedly. You would be right without having to prove yourself right. You think what millions of men musicians think, and it may be, oh, I can't see because of my screen. Okay. That's okay, we're gonna pick up here. But after all, that's not the issue, is it? You have, we're gonna go right here. You have generalized no end to prove your point, always adding in your liberal way with few exceptions. Women musicians are inferior. That's your point, isn't it? You were a bit vague even about that. But the editor kindly clarified the subject in the headline. And why are women musicians inferior, if they are? Since you are not particularly enlightening, as to the reason such a broad statement might be true, we'll hand you a few tips if you give us an audience and don't rush for the exit because a woman is speaking. 
We'll use a low, well-modulated voice and powder our nose and comb our hair. And then too, as we have inferred, women are never hired because of their ability as musicians, but as an attraction for the very reason that they are women and men like to look at attractive women. Consequently, the manager is continually reminding the girls not to take the music so seriously, but to relax, to smile. How can you smile with a horn in your mouth? How can you relax when a girdle is throttling you and the left bra's ear straps holds your arm in a vice? If we quaver a little on the high notes, it's because we are asked to do a Houdini. And if we hit an occasional blue note, it's because we play with too much feeling and mascara gets in our eyes. On the other hand, men's orchestras are usually hired because of their ability as musicians. Their good looks, their presentability other than neatness rarely will enter the question. Even the best girl bands in the country have to have an SA artist fronting them to captivate the audience while musicians in the band indulge themselves in that orgy, orgy of a facial contortions which seems so important to you, Father Superior. Men have always refused to work with girls, thus not giving them the opportunity to prove their equality. This is especially true of wind instrument players, obviously one of the foci of your attack, Father. Girl violinists and stringed instrument players have had breaks. Descending to the personal for a moment, I wish to add that I have a few girls in my band who could hold first chairs in the best men's band if given the privilege. But what men's orchestra would consent to such an experiment? A great many men musicians have highly complimented my band, saying it was as good or better than their organizations. But if the question of actually giving us an opportunity to establish our equality arose, we should immediately be relegated to an inferior plane and given the form answer A, it's not being done. You say that women musicians are inferior because of lack of practice. If that's true, it's because there is no future in music for girl musicians for the reasons previously mentioned. Woodshedding would be fun if we could see there was anything to be gained by it other than personal gratification. However, even you should agree as an artist that that is an admirable motive in itself. Oddly enough, Father, they take just as much pride as men in their work and they woodshed as much as men and perhaps more because of the obstacle of prejudice to be overcome and because of the harsh criticism fired at them from all sides, such as that in your article. As for the point you noted that women are not compelled to support themselves, we urge you with an apologetic banality to go west, young man. Evidently, you haven't gone farther in that direction than Chicago. Now, in California, it's different. The women support the men as well as themselves. Step around a little more, father, and have a look-see. There are several Mrs. Prima, Eldridge, Musso, and Tambauer in circulation. And you are a fair-minded gentleman. Be gallant and respond to their cries for help. Very humbly yours, Peggy Gilbert. Just let that sink in for a second. It takes me back every time I read it. 1938. That's not that long ago. And you'll see there's still these prejudices from the 1520s, way before 1520s as well. And we're going to see it continue into our modern day. Let's do a brief timeline to put this into perspective for you. As we learned throughout the 1800s and beforehand, women were not encouraged to play wind instruments. In 1990. Eight, the first women's orchestra was founded by Mary Worm in Berlin, who was actually a student of Clara Schumann. In 1913, the first woman was hired in an orchestra. It was the Queen's Hall Orchestra. However, it was only violin, as Sir Henry Wood said, that's the only instrument a woman should play in the orchestra. In 1930, harpist Edna Phillips was hired in the Philadelphia Orchestra. In 1941, Horn player Helen Kotas was hired in the Chicago Symphony, making her the first female principal brass player to sit in a major American orchestra. 
In 1952, Dorio Anthony Dwyer was appointed principal flute of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, making her the first female principal woodwind to sit in a major American orchestra. And then a quick shout out to our own Frances Blaisdell, who became the first female woodwind to perform with the New York Philharmonic. In 1982, the first woman was hired in the Berlin Philharmonic. And in 1997, the first woman was hired in the Vienna Philharmonic. Y'all, this isn't ancient history we're talking about. We're not talking about the 1528s anymore. This is information and facts in our roots within our own reach. And even though we, we just saw that there are women breaking into the scene, their treatment wasn't just. Over here, we have a picture of Alice Chalafo, who's a harp player for the Cleveland Orchestra, who had to use her case as a dressing room because she wasn't provided the same courtesy the men were. And even Dorio Anthony Dwyer said she didn't feel too much discrimination from her peers, but she'll talk about how the string players sometimes would mock her voice on their instruments and they released lobsters in her dressing room before. These are all little acts of what could be considered as microaggressions, you know, and as we go in, you know, we're going to be using Dorio Anthony Dwyer's career now. We've seen what led up to that time. And now let's look at her career and how there's parallels from before and all those documents we read together. Her, Dorio Anthony Dwyer, if you don't know much about her, we're going to go through just briefly some interesting facts about her. Um, her first glimpse of sexism was actually in her own home. There's a wonderful 2007 Louisiana State University doctoral dissertation done by Kristen Elizabeth Keem, and she got to interview Dorio, and it was revealed that Dwyer's father was not fond of their relative Susan B. Anthony. Interesting parallel there. She's a Dorio Anthony Dwyer is a distant relative to women suffragist Susan B. Anthony. I think that's very interesting. But Dwyer revealed to Keen that her father regarded her as something of an oddity. And that really left Dwyer feeling like she would never be good enough or like she wasn't intelligent enough as a woman to make it. But thankfully, her mother told her to never put herself down. And she shared with Keen that her mother said, don't be worried that you're female and everyone puts you down. You can do something of your own if you want. Just follow your values and standards. And I think we have a lot to thank to her mother for building her up in this confidence. And we're going to see this confidence blossom when we get to her audition story. You know, and she and her mother was also her very first teacher before she went to go study with Ernest Legel in the Chicago Symphony. And she would wake up at five in the morning, take a five hour train, and sometimes wouldn't return home till after midnight. She was dedicated. So much so that Howard Hansen gave her a scholarship to study at Eastman with Joseph Mariano. And so she gratefully accepted and she went and unfortunately she also faced sexism there. She was never allowed to sit principal at any of those major ensembles. And, you know, she there was an interview done with the Flutus Quarterly magazine by one of her former students, Tasha Kokono, where Dwyer revealed that her professor told her, Dorio, you have to play 50% better than the boys. Do we see that parallel from Peggy Gilbert's response? Women have to play a thousand times better. She was told that right to herself. She's going to have to play better than all the guys just to be noticed. And then, of course, she ended up graduating in 1943 with a bachelor's and a performance certificate. And she went on to have careers in the National Symphony Orchestra, the L.A. Philharmonic. She toured with Frank Sinatra. Never sitting principal in those, though, except she did get to sit principal in the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra as Bruno Walter invited her. And Bruno Walter was one of her champions, along with Leonard Bernstein and Isaac Stern. Of course, then comes 1952, and that's when George Laurent announced his retirement as principal flutist with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Dwyer felt like she had absolutely nothing to lose, so she submitted all of her necessary materials and signed it, Miss Dorio Anthony Dwyer. She didn't want a single confusion about her gender. She wanted fair game. And her audition process is quite legendary. So Charles Munch was the direct music executive director at the time, and he played and he interviewed and auditioned a lot of male candidates, and none of them impressed him. 
So he went to George and asked, who do you recommend? And he recommended Lois Schaefer, this lovely lady on the top. And that made Munch remember these letters he received from Isaac Stern and Bruno Walter about Miss Dorio Anthony Dwyer. So sources say that he said, let's have a ladies day and have them both come. So they went and in uncommon practice, there was no audition list. These ladies dueled back and forth. And after some time, Schaefer was dismissed and they continued, continued to drill Dwyer for two more hours. In fact, she had everything memorized. And remember how I mentioned she was really bold? She turned to them and said, what do you wanna hear? I'll just play it. And finally, some time was dismissed. She went home and they asked her if she'd be willing to come back after some more sources say Munch wanted to hear some more European male candidates and Dwyer refused. Thinking nothing was gonna come from it, she continued on with her life and she ended up getting a phone call about two months later and she had been offered the position. But she was a very smart woman and she had already researched the pay rates around the area. And she was negotiating her salary and the committee came back to her and said, that's a lot of money for a little girl. And she said, it's a big job. So she was bold, very, very bold, despite everything that we learned that was going on in her time of playing flute. And then let's see. And then just to show, I'm going to share this. Hopefully the sound works. This is just a brief interview clip of her talking about her before auditioning. All of the tri trials they had to go through. So everybody wanted the Boston Symphony job when it opened then? I don't know. I think they were scared. Uh -huh. I think they were scared to death. And I wasn't scared because uh, if I was scared, I wouldn't be trying out. <laughs> I would be like this uh -huh. and I couldn't really hold the flute and, and I thought you know if you're if here you, you just can't be scared and uh, taken up with my my feel feeling for being nervous or something I had to go right ahead and do it and I knew that they were ever going to say bravo they're not going to do that because <laughs> I was a woman and, <laughs> and maybe if I did pretty well the orchestra would cheer me as they cheered their own. But I thought, but that's other men cheering their their own. And I don't know what is going to happen to me. So, so one. So as you can see, very bold. But she was, she really disregarded the fact that she was a woman and went for all the same opportunities that everybody else did. And, you know, she is considered a pioneer female flutist. And I think we can see why. And she went on to have an illustrious career and, but before that, the Boston Symphony of course had to announce that they had chosen her. Here's just a little snippet of the press release. I'll let you read that. Absence of domineering female suggestion. That goes back to those articles from 1528, 1722, 1938 of this idea that a woman is supposed to be so mild and prudent. It's almost as if they felt like they had to defend their choice of a flutist when they really did. Her playing would speak for itself. And in fact, it did once, you know, she played, she was sat principal there until about 1990. And when she passed away in 2020, her daughter Arian did some interviews around and with the hub of the League of American Orchestras, she shared the story of, I guess, the Boston Symphony Orchestra took a tour to Moscow and they played Afternoon of a Thon. Of course, all of us flutists here know, very legendary, a dream thing to play. And apparently afterwards, the audience roared and carried Dwyer out on their shoulders into the streets like it was some rock concert. Like that is unheard of. So you would think with this, and I mean, Walter Piston wrote pieces for her, Leonard Bernstein loved her. She was beloved by many and the audiences in the classical music world came to love her despite the initial shockwaves that were sent through them. And you would think with all of that, we would see more and more female sitting principal and a more even device and that the gender proportions would be more equal. Let's see how true that what that is. So there is a composer and blogger 
Subi Rahman, who looked at the gender proportions in America's top 20 orchestras in 2014. Um, he sampled about 100, 1,833 musicians. And of the flutists in that group, 68% identified as female and 32% identified as male. Okay, so that's kind of getting more with the statistics of what people think today. So obviously we're seeing some progression from Dorio to 2014. But how many do you think, like if we were to look at the makeup of the principal position, how many do you think were men and how many do you think would be women? 57% of the principal flute positions at this time were held by men. And these numbers don't really make sense in my head. They don't completely add up until you think about all the articles we read and potentially the reasonings behind it. Here's a graph of it just to show in case you're a more visual person like I am. And just to show it's not just in the flute section. Males are dominating in every regard as in leadership positions. Okay, let's jump forward to 2018. There's a wonderful article by Jeff Edgers for the Washington Post on the case of Elizabeth Rowe, which we'll dive into. But in this article, he reviewed tax filings from orchestras containing the top 78 paid musicians. The top male earner was revealed to make 535,789, such a large sum I can't imagine making, I can barely say it. Now, it was revealed the top female earner was made $410,912. Yes, these are both very large sums, but what's also very large is the gap in between them. That is a very, very large pay gap. And when looking at the gender makeup of these 78, how many do you think were men and how many do you think were women? Think about it, think about it. Sixty-four were men, leaving only 14 on that list identifying as female. And of course, because the majority of us here are flute players, there were five flute players included on the list. All were principal players, which makes sense. All were men. Not a single female principal flute player in the country on this made it on this list to make made enough money to make it on this list it's disheartening but let's continue further jump ahead to 2019 we're going to look at the gender proportions across 40 world class symphonies in the US UK and Europe the principles the makeup of it was 83.2% identified as male. 16.8% of principal players identified as female. And just a fun fact, the Berlin Philharmonic only had one female principal and it was the second viola. Maybe co-principals will be better. 64.82% identified as men, leaving 35.18% to identify as female. So we got a little closer here but still very largely predominated in those leadership positions by men. And just another graph to really hit it home for you, just to show that drastic disproportion that we have. Now, in case the graphs didn't hit it home for you, what really hits it home for me are firsthand accounts and firsthand stories. So let's look at some. Rewind one year to 2018, there was a case of Elizabeth Rowe when she sued the Boston Symphony Orchestra. She began sitting principal around 2004. So interesting parallel. We have Dorio Anthony Dwyer around 1990, Elizabeth Rowe sitting in that same chair about a decade and a half, two decades later. And we won't go through the whole case, but what you need to know primarily is that Elizabeth Rowe sued the Boston Symphony Orchestra for making around $70,000 less than her male counterpart, which was the principal oboe. Now there's a, like lots of arguments going around and the main one was that flutes and oboes just aren't comparable. And that's true, they are very, two very different instruments. They have different roles. However, if this were true, the statistics that we read before and the tax filings should support it, but they don't. 
In the St. Louis Symphony, the male principal flutist made $166,191 and made it on that post-examination tax records. But the principal oboe, who was a female, didn't even make enough to make it on that list. This is not about instruments. This is about gender discrimination and the prejudice that has been here since 1528, 1722, 1938, and long before. Let's take it outside of flute just for a second. Because as Elizabeth Rowe's story came to light, a bunch of other stories that had already happened were brought to the forefront. And it reminded me of the story of Abby Conant, who's an American trombonist. She went to the Munich Philharmonic and she ended up winning the principal trombone job. They were shocked she was a woman. Couldn't believe it. They thought she was a male. There was like a miscommunication in translations. And they let her sit there. But then the music director switched. There was a new one. And he could not stand Abby Conant sitting there. They spread lies about her playing, even though all reviews were stating differently. They demoted her to second trombone and Abby had to go through years of litigation. And she finally got her principal seat back just to find out she was making less than her colleagues. And then Abby also shared a story of her student who auditioned with the Bomberg Symphony Orchestra in 1994. And she, her student was told, you won the audition, but we're going to take number two because we think having a guy in the section would be better for the first trombone. Shocking to say, shocking, but not surprising based on what we've read and learned now. Let's bring it back to the flute world and our very own Brooke Ferguson, who is who was principal flute player for the Chicago, not the Chicago, the Colorado Symphony Orchestra. She interviewed with Jeff Edgers, who wrote the article I mentioned previously, and she shared that she filed a gender discrimination claim with the U.S. Equal, US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, a tongue twister for me there. And speaking with him, she revealed some documents where she was, there was inappropriate sexual comments made by management. And I'm going to quote here, there was orchestra executives questioned her resume and quote, offered her a raise only if she waived her legal rights. And despite that, you know, the Colorado Symphony chief executive and boardman of the trustees came out and said, our orchestra has more women than men. Our concertmaster is a woman. I think you'd be hard pressed to find another woman on the orchestra who would complain about discrimination by management. Now, in theory, this sounds, regardless of all the things, there were 32 women in the orchestra and 48 men. But even moreover, regardless of all of that, this caused Brooke Ferguson so much distress. She had to go on sabbatical, go to therapy, and we wonder why more women don't speak out. It's because they're told things like this. They're shut down time and time again, and people don't listen to their stories. This is hers, and it happened. It's real. And we'll do one more by Ariana Gez Farrell, who was the principal oboe for the LA Philharmonic. Her teacher told her to play with virility because they're going to want to hire a man. Sexism from 1528, 1722, 1938 is still furiously thriving today with our friends and our colleagues. But just to keep things positive and some positive notes happening, um, women outnumber men for the first time in the New York Philharmonic. It only took 180 years to do so, but they did it. <laughs> And then the Berlin Philharmonic announced its first ever female concertmaster in its 141 year history. So we're making progress. It took a long time to do so. So it's problematic in its own, but I do just want to share these brief highlights of where we are making strides. And so with all of that, we're kind of left here with how do we combat this? What do we do? You know, it's, all of this can be so heavy feeling. And if I take it down to the smallest scale that I feel I can, I feel like it can be done in our private lesson studios. I'm assuming there's a lot of us in the audience that have private lesson studios or have students or people we teach in some regard. And I'm going to ask, 
Who were the first flutists you were told to listen to by your teachers? Think about it. My guess is, based on a poll I did in my undergrad, most of you were only given male flutists to listen to. James Galway, Jean-Pierre Rompal, Emmanuel Paoud, all fantastic flute players that we should listen to. But what about the rest? <laughs> what about the Jasmine Choys, the Valerie Coleman's, the Paula Robinsons? We can name so many. And if you feel, if you want to type in your famo, favorite female flute player in the chat, go for it so we can all listen to some afterwards and have some more recommendations to give. And I also want to share that one of my students, I had her playing the Chaminon. We all know the Chaminade concertino. However, it took me a while to realize she didn't know Chaminade was a woman. Because during this time period, most are men. And we could pass off Cecile as a man's name, you know. She just assumed. And if a lot of you don't know, Chaminade composed over 400 works. And she's only remembered for about four. Because so many of them were shunned off for being considered too feminine and were salon music only. So let's make sure when we're recommending flutists, let's make sure we're giving female composers as well, but make sure we're educating them on their history and where their roots come from. I think people deserve to listen to people that look like them, to see themselves succeeding. And with all of that, sometimes students, as well as all of us, maybe we Google who are the best flute players. Who should we be listening to? And there's this list of 10 famous flute players and there's only three women listed in the top 10. And then they go on to list some more. And out of about 22 flute players mentioned, there was less than 30% on that list were women. And that's kind of sad and problematic because there's so many amazing ones out there that I'm sure we all know. There's another list on Ledger Note, the 2023 update, where Jared made this chart for us to look at the top 10. And on this list, there's only two women. But what I want to point out is that most of the people on this list are associated with an orchestra. And as we've learned, women were pushed out of the orchestra. It was a boys club. They weren't in it. So maybe as we get more women in orchestras and in these leadership positions that's so necessary, we can expand this list to be more, more diverse. Now, what sexism can look like on a smaller scale rather than a national is up for debate. Maybe you want to share some stories in the comments of what it's looked like for you. Maybe it's when you're trying out band instruments and you see the band director steering boys away from the flute and, or pushing girls away from the brass instruments. Because this extends far past the flute. And there are so many more issues beyond sexism in orchestra. There's racism, ableism, classism all the isms. There's so many issues for this presentation. We honed it on one, but know that it extends past this and past flute. Did you know there's no female brass players in the Cleveland Orchestra like today? So just know, be aware of this for our colleagues. Share it with your fellow musicians what it will look like for you. I'm going to look at this chat real quick. Yeah, we're getting some great names. Awesome. But think of the ways that what it will look like in your life in your flute studio, in your bands that you work with, and try your best to stop it. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying it's going to be something that's done overnight. It's going to take small strides. We've seen how long it's taken us just to get to the first female concert master of the Berlin Philharmonic, 141 years. But maybe the more people that are educated and know, the more of a difference we can make. And just a brief little wrap up, as we've learned, sexism has been in music for centuries. We saw documentation of it in the 1520s, in the 1720s, in the 1930s, today. I'll be interested to see what the statistics are that come out post-COVID and see where we're at. But even though Dorio Anthony Dwyer was the successful pioneer flutist, the sexism she faced is still prevalent today. And there's still a lot of work we have to do, but it can begin with each and every one of us. I'm just going to briefly stop the bibliography in case you want to look up any sources. And if you want to connect with me after to chat or any questions or any links, 
please feel free to find me on Facebook or Instagram. My name is Faith Orcutt. My Instagram handle is at faith underscore O and my email is orcuttfaith at gmail.com. And thank you so much for listening today. I'm going to open up the floor to some questions. Thanks so much, Faith. That was a lot of fascinating information. Does anyone have any questions for Faith? Yes, I will echo that. Well done. I thought it was interesting. Ah, she's like, can you go please back to the first page of your bibliography? Let's say if you want to take a screenshot of that. Yeah. I highly recommend reading this article at the bottom. It's the Washington Post article by Jeff Edgers. It's a long read, but it's fantastic. It's interesting where they got all of the sal uh, salary transparency information. It's mm -hmm. like when you monetize it and put the numbers on paper, that has a sobering effect. And Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely heavy <laughs> topic in a way. A lot of the orchestras are nonprofit organizations, and I don't know if there's any kind of laws about salary transparency. I know they're doing that a little bit in New York, but um, how much of a difference that makes. Ah, we have a question. How is pay discrimination based on gender being addressed in U.S. orchestras now? So as you know, the earliest statistics that I was able to find is the 2018, 2019. I think that's kind of when we almost went on pause for COVID and went through all of that. Um, we're still, it, a lot of people aren't very open about pay. And I think a lot of women feel like they can't speak up for fear of losing their job. I'm sure they don't want to go through years of litigation. So they just keep their mouth shut. I'll be curious to see where things go if we get anything after. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about blind auditions, but I would like to remind everyone that blind auditions are only blind so far. They're not blind until the end. I know it doesn't exactly answer the question, but I'll be curious. I haven't seen too much from today, like 2022, but we're not seeing equal treatment as of Brooke Ferguson, which was very, very recent. Yeah, and I think that's an important distinction that you know, we think, okay, there's a certain amount of equity because they are blind auditions. But yes, once you get to the top, what, couple of candidates, then it's, that's becomes not a thing anymore. And so it, then it's bias has a chance to be part of things. Mm -hmm. Did someone have a question? If you, ah, there was a question about musicians unions helping to equalize pay between the sexes, which I was wondering that too, if being a part of the union, like this is the set rate for musicians for what mm. like a principal gets this amount, no matter who it is. You know, I'm actually currently not a part of the musicians union since I'm still just a student. If there's anybody in the audience that is a part of it and would like to speak on that, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. I don't claim to know everything. <laughs> I'm assuming it helps on a smaller scale and those smaller orchestras, definitely for sure. Um, for sure though, yeah. Just reading all these comments that are coming in. Yeah, somebody pointed out that many orchestra conductors are still men and not women. There, this is very, very true. Um, it's affecting so many things and it's also affecting on an interesting level. They, um, Julia did a, presentation last time for the NFA about gender in education and mentioned that only about like 10% of college band directors are women in those leading positions. It's really in every aspect of our lives. Uh, hand raised from Rebecca Johnson, go for it. Hi, I'm off camera camera because it's my spring break and I'm in sloth mode. Um, but I just wanted to say I heard just the other day a statistic to that right now in 2023, I guess the most recent census data, though, probably from 2020, said that for the first time, um, unmarried adult women are more than 50 percent of the female population. And it's um, 
and the reason that is is really interesting is because in 1900, when the uh, census started keeping track of this information, women um, were only seven percent. Like only the only single adult females were seven percent of the population, which means everyone over 18 who was female was married except for 7%. And so the part of what makes this really an issue with what you're talking about with the gender discrimination is that if pay is not equal and you have suddenly now more than 50% of the female population as you know head of households or, or supporting themselves and their families, um, it's really an issue for the economic uh, impact of all of those families when the pay is not equal. And so um, I hope that more like this and also you know as we continue to find new ways to combat gender discrimination will hopefully help you know all of us be able to live better and support our families and all of those kind of things yeah thanks for sharing that i hadn't seen that statistic yet now i'm gonna have to go look into that just an update as i was reading through the comments somebody mentioned that union rates only cover base pay and it's up to the individual members to negotiate what's over that so i'm assuming that would apply to like principal positions yeah so elizabeth rowe had tried to negotiate for years and years to make the same pay and before she was hired she tried to get the same pay as the principal oboe and it never happened she fought that for years and years until she finally came out with a public lawsuit one of the very first lawsuits to go public brooke ferguson's didn't go super super public until after the fact Well, thanks for your comment, Rebecca Johnson, about that. I think that has a really big economic impact as well. I, I mean, this is a little bit unrelated, but I remember my mom telling me a story. She was in grad school and really wanted an assistantship. And they said, oh, like she asked her professors, why didn't I get this? And she was in the psychology department, but they said, oh, well, you have a husband, you don't need it. And it's like, I mean, this was in the seventies in Lincoln, Nebraska, but that's that mentality. I, sometimes it feels like it carries over and like that's not that far removed from where we are now. Yeah, definitely. Are there any last questions or comments or anything? I really appreciate you all showing up today and to listen to me talk at you for like an hour. <laughs> Thanks so much for your presentation. Virtual round of applause. Thank for you bringing this issue to light and for talking about it and keeping this conversation going. So I encourage everyone to reach out to Faith if you have any more questions or information, keep the conversation going. And thank you all for coming today. Thank you all.